Thank you, Aziz. And as we, as we have all observed, it's tough to occupy the floor with Aziz at any, at any point. But we, but we will, you have to dance uh, with, with energy. But before introducing um, the, the artists a little more formally, um, I wanted to just take this opportunity to thank Aziz, Deborah, the whole team at, uh, at the New Art Gallery Walsall, but also to congratulate you. Um, I think what we have all seen and been part of um, also in the spirit with which the day has been run today, uh, I think says a lot. Uh, it says a lot about the types of conversations that have fed and I'm sure will feed uh, into not just uh, Walsall, the Midlands, but, but beyond. Um, with that, um, I, the way we will run this, and you, I think you'll, you'll see a familiar trend, uh, I'll give a very brief bio because I really want to spend um, the time available to, to, to listen to the, the artists uh, talk and for us to have a conversation together. Um, and then um, Jaran, uh, Hardeep and Sadia will briefly introduce their work. Um, and I, I have to hold up my hand uh, because, you, you know, and I think this is probably the first time at this exhibition that you're all meeting. Um, this is the first time that I've got to see uh, the sort of work from Sadia and from, you know, Charan in a, in a formal capacity. Um, and of course, I've had the pleasure of working with Hardeep before uh, in the British Art Show. So uh, I think it's important then to actually acknowledge the different uh, places and spaces and trajectories that we're all coming from, uh, even as we form the us of the title um, and, and respect those trajectories. And I think that's what we will do by um, getting familiar a little bit with, with, the, with the work. And then we open this up uh, to a general conversation. Um, Charan Singh is an Indian-born artist, MFA from the UCA in Farnham and a PhD uh, from the RCA. He's interested in interrogating and responding to the void that exists in visual representations of desires, identities, gender, sexualities um, in contemporary queer culture and colonial archives. Um, and he, in, in earlier this year, he was selected for the new Contemporaries exhibition and lives and works between New Delhi and London. Hardeep is, uh, Hardeep Pardal is based in Glasgow um, and he is, you know, his work has, you know, uh, been shown in numerous solo and group exhibitions, most recently at the New Art Gallery Warsaw and the British Art Show 9 in Manchester, Wolverhampton uh, and Aberdeen. In 2018, uh, he was shortlisted for the Jarman Award. And of course he is relatively local to here from, from, from Birmingham. So again, I think that uh, the point that we started with uh, as to the centrality of the Midlands uh, in telling these stories and building these worlds. Uh, Sadia Rahman is a multidisciplinary artist and educator. Um, they're uh, interested in questions of race, empire, and labor, and by exploring structures of the family, nation, and border. So small, small issues. Uh, you'll run out of things to, to, to think and work through. Um, in 2023, um, uh, Sadia had a, uh, a major three-year project on grief, memory, and displacement at the Vexner Center for the Arts in their solo show. And I will read out this title because it's a beautiful title. And I think it says a lot about uh, the thinking that goes here. And it's, the river runs slow and deep, and all the bones of my ancestors have risen to the surface to knock and click like the sounds of trees in the air. Uh, this, is, this is taken from um, Sadia's sister, uh, the writer Bushra Rahman's poem, My Abba's Masjid. And I'm, I'm sure she'll, they, you will speak about it more further in your uh, presentation. With that, uh, I will hand over to Charan. Okay. Thank you. okay, so I will start by saying, I mean, thanks. And I think everybody have done that. So I would start by saying that uh, art is still a privilege for many, many, many people in the world. And 
particularly in my world where where I come from, uh, and also by saying that the margin that we heard about this morning and in the afternoon looks very, very different when you are in a third world country and thinking about, or you don't even know that margin, what the margin is in many times, because very often the theorization of margin exists in English language. And I think Pamela earlier said that, you know, language is so important. And I think I'm going to say that the people that I worked with, uh, uh, they only exist in English language, uh, but in a very different kind of context. And I'll speak about that. Uh, so can we, uh, I think there's a kind of, yes. Oh. Yes. So my thing is all about always about being in that place. And and then what is the relationship to the world? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so my journey, you know, a lot of people have claimed that activism or activist or these kind of positions start with finding myself in a kind of like troubling time, which was the beginning of HIV pandemic in India, or at least conversations about HIV pandemic in India in early 90s and found myself in cruising spaces and found other people who are like me in the cruising spaces. And then that led to uh, organizing people uh, and educating ourselves uh, about the disease. And uh, and I think a lot of the, and we also heard earlier the queer, queer activism or activist, at a lot of the time we don't also acknowledge that AIDS was very, very big uh, uh, occupy the space within that queer activism. And it brought also a lot of people together in some ways. Uh, so I started this work working in the late 90s with this organization, primarily teaching people even how to write their name. So you can imagine how difficult it would be for them to understand this alien disease, which is coming from America, would be, you know, in that that kind of context. So a lot of people were writing, you know, that like the name of Papu and very often very what happens that uh, people are asking me to write their lover's name and their like, name is Kareem. And then when I'm trying to expel them, you know, maybe better in English because it's an easy way to write, you know, straight lines and all of that. But then she said that, oh, my, my lover's name is so sweet. And when I'm speaking... And it doesn't have any edge. But when you see Kareem, it has all the like sharp edges with K and A and all that rest of it. Uh, so a lot of it is about the language and the, the beauty of it and how we exist and how we express our desire. And then come Judith Butler and Foucault and then we completely, you know, overtaken by this theoretical frameworks. Uh, so next, next, please. Uh, and... Uh, Thinking about uh, 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 Chitra earlier on, so comic book has also important role playing and thinking about uh, uh, desire and uh, very you know all these other kind of things. And so I created a comic book uh, in 2005, talking about the love story between the two and the trans person and the, and their lover, and thinking about HIV and AIDS and how. Uh, so because the funding was about HIV, so I have to talk about AIDS and H HIV. But also I thought like it's a love story. It's also about the we are together and the community and all that. Uh, uh, next. And so then I was suddenly at some point I met Sunil and I was surrounded by photographers. And and I was also like getting after 10, 12 years of my working in HIV for uh, from the mid 90s to sort of like early 2000, uh, late 2000, 2009. I was kind of like also like having, having a burnout, you know, because it's not going anywhere because all of us are always have to produce our victim narratives and all of that. So and then so I thought like I should do something photography because I was surrounded by photographer Gauri and Sunil and they were talking about all kinds of very important issues. And so I decided to take some pictures randomly and then this picture randomly I took became the uh, cover page of the this magazine in which comes out of the Nepal and we talked about earlier Nepal Nepal is a very important place within South Asia how it's it can produce different kind of content uh, conversation uh, next slide, please um, so my people so again the language and LGBT and IQ and all of that and you know you find a kind of 
put into categories, which is always having to translate your experiences to these like Western ideas. Uh, when I did my MA, I I gone back to the 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 kind of categories that uh, or the expression that we come from in other languages, and I said uh, I'm not going to say LGBTIQ. I'm going to say Kothis and Hijras and the Giriyas and others because that's what we are. That's how we knew about ourselves. We didn't about knew about ourselves in like lesbian or gay because they exist in and so and also I have to say that you know when I met Sunil I didn't not I wasn't speaking English uh, so so coming back to you know after all those years of gap and learning MA uh, in and doing MA and PhD uh, also was my learning in academia but also learning English language and also reading my history and the way history was written about me and we didn't have I I, I could not identify myself in the archives of pathos and and pity and sorrow and pain because we were the hero of our pictures. So like, can we have a sex slice? So like when, when we talk, when we see them, we don't feel victim because, you know, and can I have a next, next slice? Yeah. I mean, when you talk to her, she's no, no victim of anybody. She was the heroine of herself, you know, and she couldn't make gender and, you know, she could do all kinds of things. So, so like that. Uh, so I'm, what I did in, in my PhD, I'm trying to re uh, uh, understand what happened in academia and what are the stories of my people or my, or myself by which I mean, next, let's please next, next. Uh, before MA, when I came formally to do my MA, uh, I also did this like little book, uh, about, um, because Sunil had gone away to do his residency. So I was like, okay, what, I, what should I do with the camera in the house? So I did my residency without any support. Uh, and... Uh did the the kind of like photos, but I wanted to take photos off and uh, thinking about with culture and you know all kinds of things and and cinema and created these narratives of uh, fictional characters of people who died with HIV and next slide please and and then this all these other issues around AIDS and activism and HIV. Uh, PhD, gone back to, then I found myself the page uh, you know because representations are also very connected and you know because it boils down to stereotypes very often then people try to identify oh this is how uh, gay people look in India and all that so I thought I don't want to have people in the pictures I gone back to the, the cruising spaces and trying to think about the narratives and writing stories and, and making you to understand and visualize what those stories might be next slide please and then we did the book together uh, commissioned uh, and then this this so then in when we got the commission me and Sulil got the commission we also I also had the opportunity to bring all those other kind of complications of queer life uh, people were married people were also uh, kind of like we didn't have language of being out but we have all these other kind of like way of being out and you know as you saw the people are have all this like performance and you know they're on the street they have nothing to hide I mean they, they cannot hide in the in the place because there's no privacy and because the privacy is also again the context you know the the made up context you know it's very european and and victorian you know the private space and the public space and because a lot of people are living in a one house with five people they don't have private so a lot of the play time when you know when people talk about archives and my pictures and this and that i have to con constantly destroy my pictures and constantly destroy my letters which i was getting from the other boys because we could not have held that those letters you know, so so that's that. So I find it like archive is kind of like also like very uh, for me, it's like an, I don't I don't believe in archive in that sense because I don't exist in archive. So I kind of always kind of fictionalize my own archive and I'm writing my postdoc to Greg and creating fictional archives. Thank you. <laughs> if I don't get, then I'll blame them. No, but joking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> next picture. <laughs> um, and yeah, next. Yeah. And so this, the, the, but what happened, the book then both became the exhibition and it traveled in, the, in, in Houston and, and Kochi by it for the first time, we, all of us to get both of us together, re-arrived in India with my PhD in RCA and all those Indian, you know, artists, suddenly I was like a ride for them. And they could they could talk to me, but before that, when I was all those ten years, they would not. I was not visible. I was there and standing next to Sunil all the time. They did not say, and uh, so so all of that. So a lot of the time that you know the privilege and what you do, it also defines what you are. So I find it like, still even now I find it like myself. I have this imposter sort of like syndrome that I feel still that you know. Uh, uh, 
I'm not an artist, but I have a PhD in art practice. But I, I find it like because artists also have this very, uh, you know, uh, uh, the space that art occupies. And then we are having to talk about all those like very complicated, very heavy duty issues. And how do we talk about that? Because these are the same institutions. I mean, already pe there is some echo that Sunil and Roshni were saying that we did not want to be in Tate because they were the sugar, whatever, the mill owner who was like buying slaves and doing doing all kinds of things. So uh, next, <laughs> next slide. So this is the this is the reason why I am here, and uh, uh, I got a, we got a commission again together uh, to do uh, this work in collaboration uh, with Sunil and F by Fierce in Birmingham. And uh, these are the stories of people who are trying to seek asylum in the UK from different parts of the world. And again, that 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 kind of narratives which they bring into the discourse, it's it's everyday reality. It's not happening within the institutions of any kind of institution is happening on the street as, as i said you know uh that you're being called paki on the street in the sainsbury line it's not like some institutions in that way i mean institutions happen but it's a very different kind of way of sidelining you that not giving you a grant and all that kind of stuff but but the the the, the that kind of tension is on the street uh very often next yeah so these are the slides which are part of the exhibition these are the images uh yes uh and that's how they were shown. And that's what uh, inspired me because when they told us that, you know, it is about the community and uh, it's, it'll be in the billboard, on the billboard in, in public space, which kind of like had this uh, holding that space within the Commonwealth game when the game was happening. And these are the people from the, the so-called, uh, you know, empire and all of that are coming here. And that's why I think, and all the, on the other hand, at the same time, the Pritipat was trying to send them back to Rwanda and there was this whole lingering tension that will they be photographed or not. Yeah, that's so, a completely different conference. Yes, that, that, yes, that, yeah. That we can yeah. also stage. Yes, uh, yeah. So, but, but that's what uh, the work is about. And well, yes. Thank you, Charan. And I wanted to just pick up a couple of things for us to hold uh, as we as we move forward. This idea of language and, and how we sort of reside in language. Um, I'm sort of thinking of uh, the late uh, Zarina who often describes herself as an Urdu artist uh, to, to move away from having to, you know, have hyphenations or Indian or American or Muslim to say, oh, no, no, you know, uh, she took refuge in, in the language. And so I see what you're doing in terms of trying to uh, resist the language being applied because uh, there's a certain violence that comes out of language and translation. Uh, and yes. trans so, yeah. so I think that's one thing that we uh, want to hold on to. The other is, I think, the archive, and I think that will appear also. It's already been present mm -hmm. in many of the presentations and will appear again. And I think we want to come back to this and thinking about the archive also as a place of possibility, because um, that's the Russian proverb has it. Uh, you know, the the future is certain the past is forever changing. And the archive is actually just, just the bit that we can uh, invent different pasts that we want to, uh, to invent for ourselves. So I think that we will come back to that. With that, I'm gonna pass the baton to Hardeep. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for um, having me. And it's been you know, a pleasure and quite a surreal experience for me um, because it's not far from where I'm from, Birmingham. And um, yeah, it feels unusual to be in an exhibition like this um, for various reasons. Um, but it's, yeah, it's great. It's a great feeling. Um, this is my artist statement. Um, I work predominantly with drawing and a voice to transform feelings of disinheritance and disaffection into generative spaces that bolter interdependence and self-belief. Applying practices of associative thinking. My works exhibit what I like to say are syncretic strains of post-brown weirdness. Across media, my works are imbued with acerbity and playful complexity, at once confrontational and reflective. That's the claim. Um, and this is a video still for a video I'm not going to show um, because it's not uh, practical now. Um, but I've, I've made a few sort of very lo-fi, like what I call rap videos. Um, entering, going to art school, entering the art world from a working class background in Birmingham, I thought it would be interesting to sort of um, maybe play up to expectations. Um, and um, this lyric here, so 
black and white is all I see. It's called Richie Rich. And one of the lyrics that circulates around being a rich PLC. Um, so yeah, bringing sort of class consciousness into um, the sort of sphere of like uh, racial identity politics. Um, this one follows off from that. I have, and I have declared in a lot of my work and statements that um, I share a Punjabi English language sort of barrier with my mother. Um, and I regret doing so over the years because it's led to a lot of like um, baggage with institutions and conversations and headlines and sort of press that you kind of live with. Um, but it's something that is true and um, I kind of feel it was important to signal in my work to give a bit of context, um, spe specificity to uh, my background um, and also um, to maybe open up space for others to who may identify with such kind of like predicaments. Um, and this is a jumper um, that my mom had made uh, for a family member and it was an unwanted gift. And I embroidered um, an image of Tupac, the rapper's face, American, African-American sort of celebrity um, with the words to POC on them um, and the cartoonishly loud orange um, figure, or oh, sorry, face. And the way that the uh, embroidery is done, it kind of makes the face protrude outwards. So it has a grotesque kind of um, image. And um, this belongs to kind of like a series of works that are arguably collaborative to a degree, um, although they are one-sided and that's kind of the point. I started doing them with my mom uh, about 10 years ago and um, she would make sort of garments that I would provide a bit of instruction um, for. And um, I was, I guess I was hoping that that would lead to something um, between us but um, it kind of hasn't. So I've I've sort of, um, yeah, I'm sort of like moving on from this body of work, but it's been an interesting kind of process to have circulating um, in these sorts of spaces. Um, and work that you see downstairs, um, I started a series of small drawings um, based on Sikh sepoys, colonial soldiers employ employed by the East India Company after learning about their roles about like 10, 12 years ago, um, their contributions to, you know, British war efforts and so forth. Um, and it, I felt that was kind of, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'm kind of learning um, post-colonial kind of like history and theory um, and, I'm, and I'm sort of reacting to it. And um, yeah, these drawings were kind of like um, the first things I did. I, I, that's where I started in my practice. Um, and they're based on miniature war game, sort of like figurines that people use to simulate war. Um, the kind of things that you would associate with HG Wells and, you know, like Warhammer fantasy and things like that. But um, I would never really know what, how they were used by certain players and things. Um, yeah. And I think the idea of the, you know, the British Sikh sort of sepoy, um, kind of assigned to kind of like uh, fight against um, arguably uh, their own sort of kind <laughs> um, appealed to me as a sort of um, symbol or a marker that reflected um, a diasporic kind of um, subjectivity. Um, yeah, and there's a few that kind of like circulated. Um, there's sort of commentary on masculine uh, sort of masculinity as well embedded in them and then over time um yeah the kind of character evolved and circulated in animations and and things like that so you can press play on this um so yeah i started drawing animations and combining um sikh religious uh, martyr imagery into the work as well the recurring sort of figure of a headless character um appears um Next one, uh, yeah, next one. And this is like an older version of, a, of this character, but made, made by my mother a long time ago. Um, yep, yep. And that's a drawing on my degree certificate 
um, it collaged onto a, like a l- larger picture. You can't really see what it says. Um, yeah, I think what, what you know, my experience of going to art school. I went to I went to Leeds to do my BA, and then went to Glasgow to do my MFA. Um, and I think yeah, finding yourself in sort of institutions that are you know devoid of um, of like South Asian or even Black heritage or you know in in the institutions, it kind of it can it can sort of make you react, I suppose, um, in some capacity. Um, and I went and I took a sort of like grotesque kind of um, sardonic route, um, and very conscious of like certain tropes of in British humour as well. Um, and I f- and I see a lot of repression in that. Um, and I think what I was trying to do is channel that in a way that um, hopefully um, isn't too alienating, but um yeah it's um it's what i did that's uh still from another animation a more recent one um and again an example of like the character being used just to give a sense of a broad practice uh, me using a sort of wacom tablet to render it um so it's all quite sort of hands-on um yeah, more recently, an animation video um, that takes place in an art school, um, an imagined cursed art school, um, partly in response to just teaching in, in recent years, um, and anecdotes, um, references to video games, and analogies between institutions and dungeons, uh, as in Dungeons and & Dragons, and sort of like pitfalls and traps that one may encounter um, in the system of bureaucracy. Um, so yeah, narrative works, um, installation <laughs> work that kind of speaks to entrapment and um, heritage as well. Um, but using the language of games and um, sort of adventure and quests and things like that. Um, so these are lyrics and another video associated with this. Um, and I rap over these things. Yeah, and um, the work downstairs, the newer body of work is connected to a sort of, what I'm trying to describe as like my practice as being like an ongoing sort of graphic novel of sorts or a kind of zine. Um, and I've taken like a, an incident revolving around an altercation I had at a black metal gig, um, at a Tolkien-themed black metal gig uh, a few years ago, and um, turning that into a quest. And I, and I sort of, um, yeah, started retelling that in the sort of illustrative mode of um, fantasy art, essentially Western fantasy art. Um, and there's a characters in there that are... Um, yeah, if you could go to the next one, please. Like in the in the top right hand corner, you see a sort of uh, ranger esque um, tavern scene, um, but the character has like a you know what appears to be like an Akali Sikh kind of turban. So I'm bringing these kind. Of, I'm trying to sort of like bring in these kind of like um, personal markers into this um, sort of. Um, Western, like European sort of style of fantasy art. Um, some of it's more kind of imaginative. Um, yeah. And that's a, that's kind of like a, a based on a, an actual um, artwork from Dungeons and Dragons. So, yeah. Um, some more drawings. Going back to the art school again. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we can just like leave it there and I can just introduce the, um, the, the new work. And um, the reference to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, I used to go to Bourneville to do my art foundation course and I used to walk past the Chocolate Factory and you could smell it. Um, and I wanted to kind of like revive the Sepoy character because I knew that we were going to show it here, but... I hadn't seen those works for like 10 years. And I thought, how do I make new work in conjunction with that? Because it's sort of, I haven't seen it. I don't really know what it means in the context of this exhibition. 
also with the context of like, you know, global conflict, you know, it's 24 hours. Um, so it's quite hard to kind of like um, contain all of that. And I felt like it would be good to just maybe uh, for myself um, with some discipline, like try and focus on like an ongoing sort of comic character. Uh, and there's a drawing downstairs that um, is like a Genesis sort of story. Um, and it's the, like the rebirth of this character called Sepoy Man. Um, and anecdote refers to a studio visit I had where someone said, oh, you're not black or you're not white. So I said, oh, I'll, I'll make the character gray. And I'm also colorblind. So it makes, so it kind of allows me to kind of play around with painting and like without worrying about things getting too muddy in the palette. So yeah, the chocolate and the Charlie factory work is an attempt for me to kind of like retell that story, but really kind of like focus on the ideas around consumption and platforming within sort of representation and art also in gaming um and then yeah there's all sorts of things within that story that kind of like chime um temperance and like morals um competition um success i suppose as well um so yeah that's kind of where i'm at thank thank you are the I think just a couple of things for me, for, for us to sort of also keep in, in our mind, is I think we come back to the, the forms. So the form of the comic book or the animation or here, uh, the use of words uh, in, in rap and how they circulate. And for those of you who haven't seen the Richie Rich video, I would highly recommend it. Just Google it on YouTube. Um, and, and, and also just think about the, the longer trajectory of sung protest poetry uh, from whichever part of South Asia that you, you may know of or associate to and, and think about those longer genealogies. Um, uh, anyway, with that, we'll pass over to Sadia. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay. Um, Thanks for coming on a Saturday, spending some time with us. And also, uh, yeah, thank you to Deborah and Aziz, very much so. I've been here for two weeks, and the first week I spent in Birmingham, and the second week I spent in Walsall. I walk a lot. It's part of my practice, and so I have been walking around Birmingham and Walsall <clears throat> Uh, for some time and it's been just an amazing experience. Last time I was in the UK was in 2005 and um, I want to come back. So uh, specifically to Birmingham and uh, Walsall and I'll talk a little bit about that some more. And just hearing, you know, Taryn and uh, uh, Hardeep talking about their work, um, I just and everyone talking about their work, I just realized we we are learning so much just to unlearn it. And so and also, you know, it makes me also think about um, uh, paraphrase James Baldwin quote of, you know, I know you more than you know me speaking about African-Americans and then globally black people. Um, so I'm going to read a little and also um, speak a little off the cuff, as they say. Um, in my practice, I often think about location, place, site. And at this moment, the genocide in Gaza requires us all to think about settler colonialism, imperialism, militarism, and how they enact in our own daily lives. I think of place as a landscape, which is often thought of ideologically under domination or control. Place that is constantly being remade, that is situated in the body, place that includes many layers of time all at once. And then I wonder how do our communities fit into this place? Central to my process is the reflection on structures of empire, and labor within the family, the nation, the border. Hamad also said that. 
I I work in a multitude of ways, drawing, printmaking, sculpture, video, and performance. And you'll see a little bit um, here. And um, also, I urge you to look at my Instagram. And uh, my website is um, not really functional right now. So look at the Instagram for better photos of the work. Um, so uh, community. I learned how special community was uh, through my family. And so I come from a big family. There's uh, five siblings. And so it's a whole football team, you can say. And so um, usually I was on defense. Um, so, you know, the, you know, there was the family. But then, you know, my parents came to or went from, came from Pakistan to uh, Philadelphia in the U S and then they went to Brooklyn and then Queens. That's where I grew up in New York city, um, in the, in the sixties. And so during that time, my father opened a halal meat shop, one of the first halal meat shops, um, in Queens. And then that was in the eighties and also founded one of the first, uh, mosques in Queens as well. Um, and also, uh, what I saw growing up was uh, my family, my you know mother and father, um, welcomed and invited the the Blihi Jamaat into their homes. So we had you know open doors, um, uh, always cooking. You know, my mother was always cooking food. My father was always you know taking care of things in the uh, mosque and feeding people as well through the halal meat shop. And so, um, and also, you know, while living in apartments in New York City, they would find ways to bring in their families, like other friends into this, you know, uh, Pakistani Muslim community into the building. So that was like another way of kind of growing the community. So, you know, through this longing and desire to build, group and regroup, I found my own community of radical artists in, you know, Salga, the South Asian Lesbian Gay Association, and Saucy, and of course, you know, Chitra, and so many other, you know, artists. Um, and so what you see up here is a, you know, an expansive uh, drawing that um, is spread across two walls. The work features three central vignettes. One is of um, my family, um, there's also three butchers pinning and slaughtering a goat and three firefighters. Um, hard to see in the image, but again, look at the uh, images online. Uh, the vignettes uh, were made with large scale hand cut stencils, which is a way that I often work. Uh, the vignettes were then layered and surrounded by charcoal, saturated rags, pray prayer rug, fringe, uh, specifically Islamic prayer rug fringe, and a ledge to catch erasure and charcoal remnants. Um, and through the month-long exhibition, I visited the gallery every day and changed the wall drawing um, and erased things and added elements. And I was lucky enough to do that because I lived right near the, you know, near this place. So I would take the bus down, change some things while the gallery was open. And so during that time, I was also interacting with gallery visitors. And so, um, you know, the process of making and breaking and fixing were physical labor, uh, usually reserved for the artist in the, you know, siloed studio space, but now it's visible um, in the public space or gallery. And, you know, I continue to work on the wall and still prefer this temporary intuitive way of working. I use my studio time to experiment with material, which I had done here actually for two weeks, right downstairs on the in the first floor. You can peek into my studio. Um, there's not much there yet uh, anymore. I, you know, cut up many stencils from paper that I keep... Um, using until completely ruptured. Uh, many times I plan out the wall drawing and then, you know, my work is site reactive. So, you know, while here I was speaking to a lot of staff members and also people I met on, you know, in Birmingham and in Walsall. And so the um, actual plan of the um, drawing had changed uh, down here. 
Um, I'd like to now play a video. And so while well, Alex is putting on that Vimeo, um, so this is a two minute video of a, uh, this is a two minute thing that I'm going to share of a 10 minute video titled, There Isn't a Stone I Don't Remember. Um, so this two channel video uh, was directly inspired by a two, 2022 trip, a 10 day trip I had taken to the Indus River in Pakistan, uh, close to where my family was displaced in the 70s due to the building of a hydroelectric dam called the Tharbella Dam. You know, the government had permanently displaced 100,000 people, uh, including my grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins. And, you know, what you see here is um, my family actually for the first time visiting the space or, or attempting to visit the space. So we, have, we had taken a motorboat to along the reservoir, you know, of the Indus um, to search for my father's submerged village and nine months out of the year the you know village is submerged and you can kind of see during the winter months uh, when the water is very low you can kind of see peaks of mosques and shrines and also the little structures that once were of um, these 200 villages that were um, and you know communities that were displaced and we can go to the next image along with sculptures, prints, textile, a textile work, and a wall drawing were on exhibit at my solo show at the Wexner Center in Columbus, Ohio, in the U.S. earlier this year. The exhibition included this wall drawing, which fell apart throughout the run of the exhibition. The clay dried and cracked and would fall to the you know, floor, only to leave a ghost of a mark on the wall. Next image. And here is the other side of the exhibit. Um, and I want to zoom into, you know, this work in the vitrine. So you can go to the next image. Yeah, that one. Um, so I, as I continue to break, put back together, faintly erase, uh, my objects are also disappearing. I composed this work titled Burn It, Bur Bury It, Drown It with a stack of my Urdu primers from... Uh, childhood into a clear basin partially filled with water and bound to a rock. Inside, elements of culture and knowledge, stories, morality, teachings, drawings, Urdu the Urdu language lessons and poetry um, were just, you know, submerged in this uh, vitrine. Next image. Over time, the, you know, the work interacts with the present, air, light, gesturing in the space, and settles, deteriorates, and morphs into shapes not yet imagined, as if illustrating how life, matter, land, or a body might also transform, resist, and persist. Next image. Uh, the texts, and so you see, you know, over a six-month period of how the um, kind of bound stack of Urdu primers um, changed the water and also changed itself and also evaporated the water. Uh, the text submerged in water evokes a burial, a submission, loss. Over time, ink sheds into water and the paper weakens and tears. Bury it, uh, burn it, bury it, drown it evokes a watery archive. Uh, letters drift away from their words and sentences as if bodies, living objects, removed from their places of origin. Next image. And now uh, we must roam is an installation comprising of a wall drawing, assemblage, sculpture, stories from my family about their displacement and the 2022 uh, trip I took to the re region. And I have been back to Pakistan quite a few times. This is the first time that I've actually um, done a trip uh, like this to the Indus, uh, serves as a conceptual and material departure point. Um, conversations I had with London-based uh, graphic artist Sabah Khan 
uh, allowed me to engage in a similar story of displacement of the Mirpuri uh, Muslims who migrated to the Midlands due to the building of the Mangla Dam on the Indus. And so I didn't know about this. Um, I, I kind of knew about the history, but then Aziz and um, Deborah had a kind of, you know, invoked it a little bit more. And I connected with um, Sabah and I met her for the first time this, you know, in the last two weeks. And so the birds uh, that you see, you know, up on the top of the uh, wall drawing, the birds in flight with packages are directly inspired from Sabah's drawings. Next image. Um, so in, you know, 2020 in, yes, 2022, I witnessed a mobile mosque, uh, boats and tent cities along the river. As my family and I traveled by boat along the Indus, I saw signs of life and death. Most strange and inspiring was a mosque on wheels. Moving along the horizon, the mosque seemed like an artifact, but from the future. At the center of the wall drawing is a drawing of this mobile mosque, a sort of afterlife of the colonial project of the dam itself. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about 20 minutes for the conversation. So please do 25. Okay, good. So great. We've, let's keep going. Let's see where we end up. Um, but I actually wanted to start, um, I'll take this prerogative to ask the first question. Um, and I'll aim it at you, Sadia, but I think then we can sort of go wider. And I'm just thinking about actually the, the, the idea of the world um, and with your wall drawing, which is very specific on a particular history, which also happens to be your family history. But, um, and 2022, so this also corresponds with the floods in Pakistan, and and that sort of giving rise to this idea of uh, environmental justice. You know, what does that look like? What does that mean for a country that has probably you know put, contributed less than a percent uh, of uh, of uh, uh, the greenhouse gases to be hit in the way it it was? and what that means for the world as it moves forward, and what kinds of migrations at what levels will, will be coming. And we're already in the midst of the, quite frankly, tiny bits of migration that we're seeing. And, and we've talked about the 1930s level of, um, uh, of reaction that we're getting to immigration. The world that belongs to us, or at least the world that we inhabit, is gonna have a lot more of this going on. Um, and I and I wanted to just ask as to how you mix or how you think about that familial with the, the planetary. Hmm. Yeah, that's a question I often think about. Um, I guess one of the, I wouldn't say, I guess I, I wouldn't say materials, but resources that I have is my family. and. Um, um, I often work um, with them. They they are part of the um, work. You you know saw them in the video. Um, often they come up in my drawings and wall drawings. And so um, hearing they don't you know when I talk to them, I they don't talk about you know climate justice and they don't think about that even though yes in 2022 uh you know this trip happened in march the floods um in pakistan happened which you know subsumed a third of the country um yeah. and most of the you know south of the country um that happened in the summertime and so when i had returned and so um back to the u.s um, and there was, and of course, you know, um, my family lives, you know, maybe a hundred miles away from the capital, Islamabad, in a, you know, tiny village. Um, and so they um, knew what was happening right next, you know, right next door. They kind of know what's happening in the U.S., um, 
and they kind of know, and they, they feel the effects of climate change. They have felt it, you know, in the, the sixties as they were being pushed out of their, um, home. But I think, um, yeah, I don't know if they, they speak in it that way. So, and although they are the ones being affected by it. And so the way that I kind of grapple with that and also struggle with it is that I just, um, have conversations with them. And then, you know, before I even screened this, uh, video, this two channel video in a, you know, wealthy gallery space, I had screened it for them. I had also, you know, asked them permission, you know, do you, do you want to be in this video? You know, I'm doing a whole research pro project about my, you know, our family, they, some of them, the little, you know, children didn't know about the history. And so they were also learning the history themselves, um, through the making of this, this video. Um, I don't know. I'll stop. I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, Charan, could I, would, would you want to add something to that? I'm also just thinking about, you know, in terms of, uh, the way you introduce yourself, uh, of being in two places of, of New Delhi and London and, and that insistence on language um, and what that perhaps brings to the, these planetary questions from those two perspectives. I think, yeah, uh, as you know, many people have theorized that the world in different languages looks different, right? And we don't identify our stories in different languages, even if is, they have been translated. Uh, and I want to like, you know, we are, of course, that, you know, the third world is the most affected by the climate change, you know, what's happening in, in Pakistan or Bangladesh or Assam, you know, there's always a right. A lot of people here think about, oh, I want to have a Darjeeling tea, but they don't know what, what's happening in Assam and Darjeeling at all. You know, people are being flooded every, 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 every monsoon. Uh, um, and again, I think what I didn't say in the, in the talk is that the, I often work with people that I, you know, they were my friends and they were my community. And they themselves didn't thought that why I am studying, you know, I already had a career. I already had, a, uh, you know, a job and, and there were all these people who I was working with. And so they don't see that, that the art is a space uh, where conversations like us can occupy that space. And same with the climate change, same with the tomato rising prices and all of those kind of things that are, don't talk about that because all those conversations exist also again in, in different kind of language and different kind of stress and tensions, you know. Um, so how I see uh, what's happening, you know, some of the people like me who are the traitors of the community are now acquiring that language of Judith Butler or, or that and trying to contaminate that other space, which has always been pristine uh, and raising these questions that, you know, uh, uh, of course that, you know, you are talking about the gender framers and all of that, but the though lesbians are on the bus are still being beaten up and those boys on the street uh, in Karachi would be also being still being called chaka or whatever, you know, the equivalent, to the, you know, all of those kind of things. And, and there's so much to learn from those kind of culture of existence that, you know, in, in, in India, for instance, we have a the festival devoted to trans people. And now I'm saying trans, but I don't used to like use the word trans because trans is also a category which you have to, you know, again, an American category, you are now translating your experience with that. But we have a festivals of Khwaja Sarai in, in, you know, in Pakistan, where Dargahs, where all the, the, the hijras are coming. And then same with the, in, the, in, in Chennai, in Tamil Nadu, you know, there's a, and all those kind of things. And so that the West have so much to learn from that. Uh, in order to understand what the world we are living in and their definition of the world and their understanding of the humanity or humanic, in, you know, so all, all those kind of things. So, so I think places like this have a lot to contribute uh, and uh, and again to understand that how, um, yeah, the planet, what their planet is. Because when I used to speak, when I moved here in 2012, a lot of people, a lot of my friends, they used to say, oh, when are you coming to Delhi? And now they say, when are you coming to India? Because of the Modi effect, you know, the whole dialogues have changed. Now everybody is nationalistic and the whole idea is changing. 
and uh, and we are responding to that kind of framework. you see that respected oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah. your Every, com- yeah, yeah, communities yeah. So you all those yeah. kotis all the hijras are now they don't call like ke ghar ka bare ho like when are you coming home or when are you coming to delhi they say when are you coming to india and what's what's uh, unarticulated in that or i think i we- I think I think there is a kind of a, there is a kind of soft div- discursive nationalist agenda which then kind of like diminishing all those other kind of bonds and and familiarity with culture you know I cannot I mean I was just having a conversation with one of the staff here that and they were telling I'm from Chennai and I'm saying oh yeah oh my wife is from Chennai and all of that and 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 they somehow went to Ajmer Sharif and then Darga and they saw the Qawwali happening and which is not allowed out in 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 somehow uh uh here in the mosque so that kind of singing and because the hybrid nation and nature of uh, uh islam or uh, uh uh or our sikhism or or our hinduism even it's a very different kind of uh, thing so i think a lot of that uh overshadowed by what media is doing so i think I, that's why i was very annoyed with this you know this this completely blind faith to technology which is also you know uh kind of occupying very idealistic sort of like approach and especially you know like when you are on your instagram all we see is this donald trump is mouthing all we see that kind of like you know priti patels like these kind of words and that make people that have a different kind of reaction to and it trickle downs to all kinds of oh maybe they are right because they are like so you know like with when and when our minister said that don't wash i am going everywhere and don't wash hand i can hug somebody and that had a replication of people poor people are dying right so all of those kind of things i think uh, important and and i think that's what i think that a lot of those kind of narratives had kind of d- diminishing slowly because we believe that this power and all those and that that's where the knowledge is coming from and and also we don't trust ourselves that we can produce knowledge a lot of people in that a lot of my friends could not could not believe that i can go and study and have phd and i have dr singh you know like that kind of thing so that's a kind of a lot of people talk about like sunil was talking about and and roshan was talking about hope and i think i think how do we live without hope is the question for me how do you still live with that kind of despair and still going on at it and finding your own way to bypass the law bypass the society things and all those people didn't have framework of coming out but they are happily like having all kinds of things with the police stations with all kinds of things and navigating their own lives I I saw a very interesting clip uh in this TV series called Invasion and there was this 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 family uh who Afghanistani family and end up uh on like this car together with a black soldier and and they the one of the child drank all the water and uh, the the soldier who's black who's asking like why did you made him drink all the water and uh, and because we have 2 miles to go and because all the like climate is happening you know all kinds of like catastrophes are happening and he says that but the water is like hope because it's, you never get to that that hope in sort of speak and uh, and that kind of sort of like what i'm saying is that uh the understanding of hope is very different perhaps uh and we maybe that word doesn't exist in that we 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 find ourselves like again like you know different kind of terminology pers- perhaps as the uh 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 not not utopia so much but i mean yeah of course like nostalgia and utopia and all of that we know we can we can f- reframe those kind of ideas but also uh, again like friendship and living together somehow the possibility of living together is a kind of like way of hope and the, when they see me that i think then when when there's kind of like material i think when i think hope is become like framework when you see actually something happening that actualness of that tangibility of that becomes hope i find it i think that oh okay yeah now so now so you you're taking also, hope from an abstract mm-hmm. into into the into re- reality into the real yes, into yes, the real yeah and in some way i mean hardeep i think what what i see um you constantly doing in in different media is uh, there's a reliance on poor materials if you like you know whether they're digital or um or drawings or or, or the wall drawings um 
and perhaps it's just me, but I sort of read into that gesture, that possibility of, of you know, knowledge production, if you can, if you, if you state it in grand terms, but also in the, in just in the idea of producing a narrative that then that circulates. Um, and, and you shared with us, your, your, your an example of working with your mom, um, and, you know, however successful or not that was, but that impulse to, to sort of, uh, overcome or, or cross, uh, language barriers and, and these sort of historical figures and mythical figures that are coming from different histories that you're sort of combining in, in, in ways. Um, there's a way to read to see this as a kind of intervention in in histories or in narrative writing or um how do you see that progressing i mean what's your project <laughs> uh, the chocolate and the charlie factory i made, I made, it, I made it quite clear yeah i think like it's um yeah i feel like it's fiction is a safe space to you know to let these things um uh circulate and like thrive um, and then you know choosing something like Tolkien or Roald Dahl knowing full well that these are you know you go to Birmingham Waterstones and Tolkien has a full shelf you know it's, it's part of the heritage you go you go to Waterstones in any city and you, you you'll encounter a Roald Dahl shelf on the on, in, on the underground floor so these are like you know these are very maybe safe kind of like um, choices, I suppose, but like within within certain narratives, like for example, the chocolate and the Charlie factory, there's a there's a segment in that where um, an Indian prince commissions Willy Wonka to uh, make a house of chocolate, and it obviously fails. But there's a subtext to that which kind of borrows from sort of colonial attitudes regarding the um, you know um, the prince the rulers of India and their incompetence, in my opinion. But it's 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 very like. It's in, in Tim Burton's film, it's there. It's in, they, they show it. So it's, it's kind of like finding ways to kind of like really just um, pick at things that are so like blaringly obvious in education, you know, um, and, and, and upbringing and, you know, so um, ones that I can have fun doing as well and like not really, yeah, that's, um, so you, uh, yeah, I think storytelling, fictioning, Estranging yourself as well in the process is kind of in also politically for me quite um it is it feels like an act to do. And if you're being platformed or visible in these institutions and you're doing that, then hopefully that can translate um in some capacity. We're coming to the end of uh, a very generous and long day, but it also feels important that in the spirit of the exhibition, that I think the QA can also be intergenerational and cross course panel. So I think it's very much a, con you know, let's have a collective conversation. Uh, so if there are any questions that you want to uh, aim here or any questions that you want to direct there, uh, please feel free. We have the roving mic. A question, but more of a comment. Um, just, it's really lovely to think about how you guys are handling some really overlapping ideas in very, very different ways formally. I mean, thinking about language and language barriers, thinking about class, thinking about displacement um, or alienation. And um, I don't have questions, but I am processing this. And it's been nice to see the images circulate as we as we speak so okay well maybe i have a question for you aziz and deborah um and <laughs> no i was just thinking because there's something um uh, there is undoubtedly a beautiful poetics to the title you know the world that belongs to us um and the graphic designer has just done an amazing job in in and actually visualizing that for us. And I think thinking about what the visual does is in enabling us to perhaps get outside our language worlds to see, uh, to see other worlds. Um, but that concept of belonging and thinking about in which way it works, you know, does the world belong to us or do we belong to the world? Um, and what, what, 
what kind of an ethics does that direction demand of us? The world that belongs, belongs to us, to right? Us. So it's yeah. also about creating yeah, that yeah. world that belongs to us. It's, I think that's really important, right? Because, and I think it's really interesting. I mean, there's, I think, and I, I've learned from you in the sense, like, you know, an exhibition is like curating is from a, like a form of exhibition led inquiry, right? Because you're always learning. It's also like a form of experimenting. Like, I think it's interesting, right? Because I'm in a curatorial practice PhD, right? And th there are curatorial practice PhDs now. And you kind of, I think, learn about like what you did like 10 years later. Like, you're like, oh my God, I did that. And this is the connections I see because like artists, like it's continuous process. But I do want to say that in some way, I'm also like, I know we've talked, I mean, you know, we've talked about inclusion and Roshini, you had this question about what happens when we're all in the mainstream or we're all represented by these institutions, right? And so is it that, is this that world that belongs to us or are we, but because what's for me really generous in everyone's work in this exhibition is they're always creating or finding or manifesting or invoking or visioning or even making space. I mean, these are also the grand words in the small ways, the world that is the world of, of, the, of the, that belonging. And that world necessarily does not exist in the mainstream institution. And if it does, even then it's hopefully subverts the mainstream institutions, right? Um, it could be zine culture. It could be Instagram. Like, you know what I'm trying to say? So in that way, for me, even disrupting technology, it is because it is a horrible thing like Facebook and, and, and Instagram, but it also has made so many worlds possible and so many people's lives possible, right? So that's something I just wanted to point to. I mean, Deborah, I don't know if you want to come in, but I do. And I do think there is then a gesture towards ethics and kind of also responsibility and care and also maybe, you know, kind of finding ways of being complex beings, hopefully, in all of these ways. Just to say that, um, I guess those concepts of belonging and world making have all been always been central. And, and to think about those. And, and we should say as well that we kind of pinched the title from an anthology of queer poetry. But um, yeah, we're South Asian poetry. But we did want a very poetic title and almost like an open-ended title to the exhibition, which didn't kind of close off any kind of avenues of inquiry and could be a, you know, could be a question in itself. Does the world belong to us? And who does? <laughs> you know, so, and um, I think it's kind of that open-endedness that I quite like as well. Um, but I would say that agree with Aziz that I think that kind of belonging, disbelonging has been a kind of central feature of the, the projects, well, the projects that we've been developing at the moment and kind of looking at those areas. But the thing is that the centres are always so narrow and so small and we give so much weight to center and you know when i got involved with the queer activism in india or uh, in delhi and and in, that's like english language activism and they always have this word like reaching out to some periphery it's like but no but periphery is the culture the kothis have the culture the queers did not have the culture they were translating the culture of the us so they did not have the culture uh, and so they are borrowing the culture that exists and the people are also being told that that is not the culture. So you are somehow also diminishing that culture by transporting this language of reaching out. And now we are going to bring them into the center and then querifying them, you know. And so that's I think I find it like sometimes uh, as maker, thinker, whatever, also have to understand. And again, like this ethics of care, is it the ethics of care or it is inclusion and in inclusion of what and in what uh, because uh, are we including ourselves are we attaching or somebody used the word like insertion are we inserting in our, ourselves into some other discourse or are we including them in our discourse so what is so i think that that imbalance of the ideas and and i think i find it i'm very suspicious and sort of you know about those kind of word and so that's why i think in my phd i i kind of like worked out this methodology of word and glossary and how those words are being understood differently by other people so the collaboration which is like very naive and very open and generous word can also mean many 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 different things and insidious things oh i'm collaborating with hamad nasar you know and but maybe he doesn't know what I'm collaborating because for, right? And so you only know that that this community, if I take photographs of that, then there is a value in that. They don't know if they they have a value in our story, right? So all of those kind of things are, and that's why I think the building relationship and you know, well, both me and Suri, we only work with people that we know, 
and therefore the friendship is ours all, all at st- and on on the stake you know if we do anything messed up then the friendship will go so all of those kind of so you have to have a skin in the game in order to like trying to use this word of like saving or making or all those kind of things otherwise it it becomes the same thing as the many other people have done you know reaching out and doing you know and because we also have access of the first world you know we have nhs and all kinds of things and going back and telling them somehow it's uh, anyway i can rent yes conflict <laughs> 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 First of all you have to sit on your hands you were to speak english you know to ha ha to kaise karo so no i'm sorry the word for me was exclusionary so we make so i wake up and i find i'm in i'm in an excluded world so if i was gay in india in 1980 i just was completely invisible there was like no space to exist So in that way, if I'm HIV positive, I have to shut up about it. Mm. I can't be invited unless I don't mention it. You know, so it's all about exclusion. When we met, there was exclusion. So everywhere there are these exclusions. I went to art school here. There was no mention of India. I mean, there was this huge exclusion. I had no past in this art system. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so it's about this. So making this word, I, I find the title that way resonates that you then get up and make the world where you are to make the space inside the exclusion zone in a way you know that uh sometimes we are successful and sometimes not so you know we weren't successful in delhi which is why we in camberwell is partly because delhi is not ready for us not because we're gay but because of who we are in other ways for in an indian setting yes as abhi hai so there are many exclusions uh i think on that note of uh, of of i think the persistence of world making and i think i wanted to end with with an image which was of um, sadia's um books the urdu primers uh, muddying that water um and i think in some way that's what many of us are are doing in our different ways yeah. so like here We suddenly just two Indian blocks. Nobody cares. I think would care in India. Why are you treated? At the same time, we are all here, and we don't bother that. Are they both Pakistani there? So in a way, we also come together by being kind of away from where we were, where they live, which is so exclusionary at the moment. Uh, you know what I mean? In a way, I just want to say thank you so much, Ahmad. to Sharan, to Sadia, to Hardeep, to Prashini, to Neel, to Chitra, Pamela for being part of this Bindi, for being part of this long, amazing, complex. And thank you for all of you for being here the whole day and having this conversation with us. I just wanted to say thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. I just want to echo Aziz's thanks to everyone, to all the speakers, and to you guys for coming again. I think some of the reason we didn't kind of ask questions some of the time was that these things are so complex, and I loved listening listening to everybody. And there's so much going on in my head at the moment that I feel it's going to take me take me a little time to unpick and kind of work it all out. But just on some practical levels, before a final thing, um, just to say that the lovely Hannah and Sophie are over here with some surveys on. tablets hopefully <laughs> that that um we would be really grateful if you would just like do a little survey um just to tell us about your experience of the day and things like that and you know we need feedback from you in order to make things better for the future and and you know if you loved having an event like this and I'm still pinching myself that we've got these people in one room together and it feels really special and I just want to thank them all for trusting in us and 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 making them come to Walsall and <laughs> and they seem to have been all right <laughs> so we like you know they seem, <laughs> yeah. and but we gathered together and that was the main thing and it was like and and and, and they created some beautiful work that's that's special and i think everyone agrees that 
you know, the work that we have downstairs is just amazing. And, and I'm looking forward to living with it for a little bit longer and being able to think about it some more. And I, and just say there's some third text knocking around as well, which has the original um, Jacques Rangasamy review of Confrontations, which featured Roshini and Shyla in it. So they're free of charge, thanks to our lovely friends at Third Text, Alice Correa and Richard Dyer. So um, thank you for them. And I just want to say a big thank you to Aziz, because Aziz and I have been like, we are an old married couple now. Um, <laughs> it is official. <laughs> we cook together, we drink wine, we talk about rubbish and that. No, it's been, it's, don't it, I don't know if people go back, but it's kind of, we met in 2015. So it's been kind of quite a journey. And this, this has been like our baby for the last three years, really, hasn't it? So, um, so yeah, I just want to thank Aziz for like the lovely relationship we've developed together and for introducing me to some of these amazing artists, some I knew already, some I didn't know already. So I'm not going to wish her on. Thank you very much. <laughs>